If we boil it down to its core, alcohol is nothing more than ethanol. It's a highly addictive poisonous substance that if you drink enough of it, you will die. And here's the thing, although I haven't touched a drop of alcohol for five years, I spent almost a decade binge drinking and going totally out of control. I have literally destroyed my life, tried AA meetings and tried gritting through it with sheer willpower. And the crazy thing is, is none of these traditional methods work to me. Now, the big question I've always had is why do some people find it so damn difficult to stop, yet others seem to just find it a piece of cake, a walk in the park? Well, this has led me on a journey to figuring out how to solve this problem once and for all. But it's not just me talking about this issue. Some of the most influential people and sharpest minds on the planet have also done their own critical thinking and come to a very similar conclusion. There is no safe amount of alcohol to drink. And there's literally not a single benefit to consuming ethanol. So without further delay, let's hear from some of those people right now. If we had to make a bad drug legal, the worst choice was alcohol. And it can turn perfectly good people into and dim-witted monsters. There is no safe dose of alcohol because alcohol affects the development of synapses of the brain. People who drink at an early age heavily have been shown to have significantly smaller brains and reduced cognitive ability. Even a little bit of alcohol causes damage in the brain. And it does that because when you ingest ethanol, it's broken down into acetylalcohol. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells and is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. I will say this, ethanol, which is the alcohol we drink, is toxic. I mean, about 10% of people become addicted to it one way or another. Really? Far more people than that abuse it. Yes, at least once in their life, yes. In fact, if you eliminated alcohol, you'd eliminate most interpersonal violence. If alcohol wasn't a thing, and you like, I've invented this drink that is gonna make you like either really happy or really aggressive or really stupid, and we're gonna just sell it to the masses, people would be like, nah, mate, keep your funky juice. Like, we don't want that, that sounds yeah. terrible. And it's one of those things, because it is so socially acceptable, that the addiction side of it, the bad sides of it, really do fly under the radar. It was one shot, two shot. What does four feel like? What does eight feel like? And all of a sudden I'm taking 12 shots of vodka, you know, on a school night by myself. It starts off as a fun little thing and then it turns into a, an escape. And then all of a sudden you don't really, you don't remember why you're out there doing stuff. It's, you just become an awful human being. Like you just, you're selfish. At the end I was alone, alienated from my friends. My family didn't want anything to do with me until I sorted this out. Living in a sh shitty apartment with barely any furniture, sleeping on a mattress on the floor. And it was, it, was, it was very dark for a very long period of time. It's very hard to have relationships when you're doing drugs and, uh, and drinking. I, for me personally, anyway. and uh, you become closed off, unreceptive, insensitive, all the dreadful things that you've heard every other pop singer ever say. I started to drink more and more and more, and it was really hard for me to accept that that meant I was an alcoholic. I was like, I can just go back. I was fine before. You know, I just need to take a break. I just need to slow down. I just need to, I, I'm okay. You know what I mean? This isn't me. And I start to drink every, every day. And I come home from work, and I start to drink, and I just sit there and drink till I pass out on the couch. And I'll tell you, I drank every single night of my life, and I never, thought I could live without it. It was more just that I lost everything. I was practically homeless, unable to hold down like a waiting tables job. My friends all started to abandon me because I was a very angry and, and horrible human being to be around. And then finally, like my girlfriend, who I never thought would leave me, like left me. And you know, it was started off with this, then it became that. And then my wife started getting on me like, Jesus Christ, look at the size of it. And I started, I go, it's a home pour. Eight minutes left in the shell, pour another one. So I poured the other one and it was over and I was walking down the stairs to our bedroom and I didn't know if she was still up or not. I literally was hiding it on the side of my leg, trying to make sure the ice cube wasn't going to clink against the side <laughs> of the glass. You know, in my case, the quickest way of forgetting about the fact that you were being watched was to get very drunk. Um, and then as you get very drunk, you become aware that, oh, people are watching more now because now I'm getting very drunk. So I should probably drink more to ignore that more. I got more as my addiction got worse, not less. My high bottom made that denial much more pervasive. And I was in that prison, even though I was fabulous and all the bullshit part of show-off business.
Now, if alcohol has been an issue in your life, let's support each other. Leave a comment down below, letting us all know how long you've not drank for and tell us where you've been tuning in from. And also, don't forget to hit subscribe. Alcohol is a really clever drug. Alcohol is a very promiscuous drug. It gets into the brain and it changes all the good neurotransmitters that you want to change. You know, a bit of endorphins, a bit of serotonin. But gradually, it sort of eats, it worms its way into you. So eventually, it kind of takes over. And you get to the situation, like, they just find themselves drinking. They don't even intend to drink. They just suddenly, they're drinking. They don't know how they got there. They don't want to do it. They don't even enjoy it very much, but they can't stop it because of compulsion. And from the first time that I ever drank alcohol. I got that warm feeling. I got that like losing my inhibition feeling and I wanted another one. And then after that, I wonder what six was like. I wonder what eight was like. Hmm, eight's fun. What's 10 like? So there's an increase in dopamine and an increase in serotonin. So it's kind of an increase in well being, an increase in mood. Very soon after, and actually triggered by that increase, is a long and slow reduction in dopamine and serotonin and related molecules and circuits. What you're getting is a blip of feel good followed by a long, slow arc of feeling not so great, which is why typically people will drink again and again across the night. And many people make the mistake of then going and pursuing the dopamine evoking, the dopamine releasing activity or substance again, thinking mistakenly that it's going to bring up their baseline. It's going to give them that peak again. Not only does it not give them a peak, their baseline gets lower and lower because they're depleting dopamine more and more and more. I wasn't drinking because I had a crummy childhood or because I was suffering from any personal trauma. I was drinking because I was physically addicted to alcohol. But alcohol has effects in lots of different areas of the brain, not just that sort of reward area, but it's also involved in a range of other neurotransmitters beyond dopamine. So, you know, things like glutamate and GABA and other parts of the brain, the hippocampus, which is involved in memory, the uh, cerebellum, which is the back part of your brain that's involved in, in motor coordination. And likewise, when, when someone is alcohol dependent, it is one of the most destructive of drugs to various parts of your of your body and different organ systems. Worst case scenarios can be things like alcohol related dementia or delirium which are serious brain problems or cirrhosis would be another really major problem. You know, these are things that people become extremely ill and need to go into a nursing home or people just die from. All I knew is that if I was continuing to go down the road I was I would either end up dead or like doing something really really stupid. And we've seen this over and over again. When people get addicted to something, then they're not achieving much pleasure at all. Addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. So oftentimes what will happen is the person only has excitement and can achieve dopamine release to the same extent doing that behavior and not other behaviors. And so they start losing interest in relationships. They start losing interest in fitness and well-being and depletes their life. Enter alcohol. And that began the sort of slow decline of my ability to express my potential not only as an athlete and as a student but as a human being because it just gradually denigrated all of my values and dented my aspirations to the point where I no really I no, I no longer really cared about my trajectory or where I was headed with my life and was solely concerned with rooting out where my next good time would be and eventually what typically happens is they will stop getting dopamine release from that activity as well and then they drop into a pretty serious depression and this can get very severe and people have committed suicide from these sorts of patterns of activity but as we know when the drink wears off it only leaves you with a bad hangover and feeling even more depressed for someone who suffers with mental health the worst thing we can do to escape it is take drugs or alcohol but yeah that's the most common approach and that's the common approach because people we don't know and it just went from bad to worse i hate the drink heavily on a daily basis i was out all night partying i didn't care about boxing i didn't care about living i just wanted to die alcohol causes depression it causes the opposite it doesn't relieve anxiety it causes anxiety if the main thing uh, in your internal or external world is a negative thing, alcohol will exaggerate that context. Alcohol was the solution, you know? For a while, it was my solution. I'm like, oh, I don't have to think about being good enough or whatever the problem was. Like, it worked for a really long time until it just left me feeling depressed, anxious, lonely, just worthless. Now, if you're feeling motivated and you know it's time to change your life, the next 30-second announcement could change everything for you. Our Sober Clear coaching program 
currently has a limited number of spots opening this month. We've already helped over 350 business owners and professionals, and we're hoping that you're next. We help our clients remove the desire to drink by using first principles thinking, and we exclusively focus on building a great future instead of digging up the past. We have a 97% approval rating and 96% of our clients would recommend us to a friend. And all this works if you've tried things already like AA, willpower, rehab, therapy, and stopping on your own. We have a totally different step-by-step -step system to follow with regular coaching and accountability and also a community of high achievers that you can do this with. And our program works quickly. The change can happen in as little as 48 hours. Now, if you do want more details, please click the link in the description to book a free consultation or go to soberclear.com forward slash YouTube to apply right now. Or if you pause the video right now and scan the QR code at the top of the screen, you'll also be able to apply for the program. And ladies and gentlemen, please do it quickly. We can only accept a limited number of clients each month. Again, if you're looking for a new way to get control of your drinking, then don't forget to hit the link in the description or go to soberclear.com forward slash YouTube before all spots are taken for the month. Because I'm negative and I'm dark and I want to do bad stuff. I want, my, I want to hang out in my, this neighborhood alone. That's dangerous to hang out in this neighborhood alone right up here, right? He wants to kill everything. He wants to kill me too. I made the right decision. I made Cuss proud of me. I made myself proud of me. I hate myself. I'm trying to kill myself. I hate myself a lot, but I made myself proud of myself. And I don't do that much. And I was happy I did that. And, um, you know, I want to change my life. I want to live a different life now. I don't want to live. I want to live my sober life. I don't want to die. I was out drinking. I didn't care. Give up. Taking drugs, like I said. And it come to a point where I was doing that for 18 months of my life. And I was out 2017 Halloween. I was a 400 pounds dressed up as a skeleton and I go to this fancy dress party and I'm looking around and I'm thinking these are all young kids compared to me. I'm 30 and I feel like I was the oldest guy in there, like 29. I was like, what am I doing here? Is this what you want for your life? And I thought to myself, this is not me. And no matter how many people told me before this, where I was going wrong, what I was doing, you need to act to your life. You can only change your life if you want to change it. I tried to change for boyfriends. I tried to change for my mom. I tried to change for my career. I tried to change for vain reasons. I'm like, well, I'll look younger and be skinny. I'll stop drinking for that. None of that shit works. I had to and wanted to get sober January 2nd, 2022, because I said, I deserve more. I deserve more out of this life. I have to try it a different way. And I have to be willing to just commit to it. No one can get sober for their jobs, for their wife, for their kids. They can't do it for any of that. They can only do it when they decide they're done. And I got back home, I didn't say anything to the wife, I went straight upstairs into a dark room. And I got on my knees and I was praying and begging God to help me. After praying for about 10 minutes, I got up and I felt the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. And for the first time in years, I knew I was gonna make a comeback. And I called my wife, I said, Paris, Paris, she said, what? She thought I was drunk coming home from the pub. I said, Monday morning, I start to regain mission to try and get the heavyweight championship of the world back. I haven't drank or uh, took drugs in six days. And for me, that's a miracle. I've been lying to everybody else to think I was sober, but I'm not. It's my sixth day, I'm never gonna use again. It was my first sober Christmas, first sober New Year, and honestly, it was the best I've ever had. I'm so thankful that this is happening. Every time I had done something or said something that I regretted, it was when I was drinking. And I thought at one point, maybe I don't want to live a life where I'm continually or even sporadically wishing that I hadn't said or done something. No, and I'm very much unlikely to do that if I'm sober and clear-headed. Yeah. Funny thing is, if you're trying to stop drinking, you need something better than alcohol. And alcohol is pretty good. Yeah. So you better find something a lot yeah. better, man. <laughs> yeah, and then it is. And then esteemable people do esteemable things. It's like, yeah, well, you want to figure out, you want to figure out something that you're doing with your life that's worth not getting drunk and screwing up. That's exactly what happened to me in Prince George. It was exactly that conversation with myself. And initially I decided six months off and then I just never went back to it. Like there were times I was like, man, I could never be a sober person mm -hmm. because I'm afraid of, you know, I can't communicate with women or I'm afraid to, you know, stand around in a circle with tough guys without having like a beer in my yep. hand, you know, or like all these little crutches, you know, yep. I can't. And then I remember when I got like 90 days sober, I was just like, holy shit, man. Like it was like the first time I'd ever done something like for myself, yep. you know? Yeah. And it just, man, it felt, it felt unprecedented. Yeah. People who ingest alcohol at any amount 
are inducing a disruption in the so-called gut microbiome. So when we ingest alcohol and it goes into our gut, it kills a lot of the healthy gut microbiome. As a consequence, the lining of the gut is disrupted and you develop, at least transiently, leaky gut. And so now you've got leaks in the gut wall, you've got the release of this bad bacteria, you've got inflammatory cytokines and other things being released from the liver, and they are able to get into the brain through neuro, what's called a neuroimmune signaling. The net effect of this is actually to disrupt the neural circuits that control regulation of alcohol intake. And the net effect of that is increased alcohol consumption. That's a bad situation. And this is why people who drink regularly, even if it's not a ton of alcohol, what you end up with is a situation in which you have inflammation in multiple places in the brain and body and the desire to drink even more and to further exacerbate that inflammation and the gut leakiness. There was this uh, conception that alcohol had some benefits um, with regard to some cardiovascular diseases. More recent studies now find that that is probably not the case. You know, alcohol is one of the leading behavior-related uh, causes of health problems and deaths and also some social problems and, and economic costs, I, you know, ranging from things like injuries and accidents to cancers and actually uh, heart and cardiovascular disease. So it causes a wide range of, of health effects. You know, you might say, well, why do people drink too much? It's like, if you like alcohol, that's a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, why do people drink too much? Well, because it's great. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, so why stop? Well, you do stupid things when you're drunk. You hurt yourself. You, you compromise your health. It's really hard on the people around you. You tend to turn into a liar and it screws up your life. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, it is, but you need something better than that. And what's better isn't being straight and, 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 and not making mistakes. It's like that's all prohibition in some sense. What's mm -hmm. better is, no, you need an adventure, man. You need to get out there and have something to do. Yeah. And, and something worth waking up for. And you need, that's the substitute for the addiction. There was something that we called the higher taste. And it was saying you can never give up a lower taste unless you had a higher taste. Sure. And so there has to be a switch. There has to be a replacement. There has to be a replacement. And 100%. so the fact that you found alternatives, I think that's half the battle. Sure. Because most of us are trying to take something out of our lives and then you're just trying to fill it. Yeah. And then you have to go back to what you had before because you're not finding a replacement. The second thing you said, which I loved, which was having this conversation and dialogue with other people someone who's one year ahead of you, someone who's 10 years ahead, someone sure. who's 20 years ahead, who's gone through that process and they're open and honest and vulnerable about, you know, I did have a weak moment or you know what, this was really tough for me. And I think having those communities where you can talk about these things makes a massive difference. And I, I stay close to people. I, I honestly believe that sobriety and being clean depends on your support system. You've got this system of people around you that want to stay clean and sober. My relationship with my friends, my family, everybody around me are so good and have been for so many years now. I wouldn't do anything to destroy that again. There, there is a lot of pressure on young people not to drink necessarily, but to find happiness through going out and getting mashed. But if it doesn't work for you, and if you keep waking up going, hmm, I don't seem to be having nearly as good time as most of my friends, uh, then, you know, then think about it. It doesn't have to be something you do, is what I, all I'd say to people. I was running to things to avoid, to avoid tough feelings, painful feelings. I just didn't know how to deal with them and looking for anything I found that I, I, I use for escape to escape those kinds of, um, I guess, difficult feelings. I don't want to be, I don't want to, at this point, to be running from anything. I want to sit in it, I want to feel it, I want to get through the rough night. And I found, um, in doing so, you just, you come out the other side with a, a more profound understanding of yourself, a, a greater gratefulness for those in your life, the birds and the trees and everything else. Fear was a big motivator in that for me. You know, losing my family, that was the thing that scared me so much. That was the bottom I hit, that my family's going to go away because of my behaviors that I brought home from the road. I got kicked out of the house by my wife. I was living on my own somewhere, and, I, you know, I did not want that. She did the right thing. She kicked my ass right the hell out of the house, you know? That scared the shit out of me. How long have you been sober now? 15 years. Friggin' saved my life, saved uh, our family. Um and working through that stuff. So very grateful for my wife. She's the one that didn't ask for this shit. She walked through fire with me and we walked out together stronger, way stronger 
than we ever would have been before. And I was like, I'm not giving up my fun. Yeah. And I could never imagine, what, well, so when I get married, I'm not gonna have a drink. So when I have a kid, I'm not gonna have a whiskey. Guess what? Yes, I didn't have any of that. And it's awesome. It was the best thing I ever did. Uh, enabled me to have a, a, a solid marriage and kids and a career. And I didn't end up a crazy actor. I thought there was gonna be ramifications, yeah. I thought that um, I wouldn't be able to meet girls if I wasn't drinking. Right, so that was things. what you were afraid of giving up if you stopped drinking. Right. What were you afraid of happening if you kept drinking? Um, I was afraid of not achieving my dreams. I was right. afraid of, you know, uh, ending up a drug addict. So why quit drinking? So I don't end up in hell. Hey, there's a reason, there's a reason to stop. And then if you make that hell real, it's like, here's all the details of my personal hell. Yes, let's avoid that. Right. So then you have something to run the hell away from. Right, so now you have something towards, towards, towards and it's something to run away from. It isn't that you're trying to avoid booze exactly, it's that you're trying to restructure your whole life. If you're a drinker, then all your friends are drinkers and you're used to drinking in every social situation. And the places that you go to socialize are places that you drink. And like, it's really built in as a whole set of habits. And so what you have to do is kind of redesign your life. You can't just stop drinking. You have to figure out what you're going to start doing instead of drinking. There's a hole that you have to fill. So I said to my kids, no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. You know what's amazing to me is how the people who make alcohol get a free ride. I don't know how we got it in our heads to, to treat one like it's completely taboo and the other we kind of shrug. I mean, it's crazy, right? It's like, it is. this is yeah. the drug that is causing so many problems for young people, particularly yeah. on campuses. Sure. And the schools are hand in glove with the manufacturers of it. Because it's socially acceptable. And we've been brainwashed by alcohol industries to believe that quitting is really hard. It's part of their propaganda. They're the ones pushing that message, which seems like, why would they tell people it's hard? But they're doing that because if it's hard, you won't quit. You know, I've watched too, as I've gone around the world, I've met very, very many people in many, many social occasions. And I, because I don't drink anything at all now, if I go out and watch people drinking, it makes everybody stupid and fuzzy minded. and. You know, the problem is, is when you're drinking, you think you're cool, but you know, you have those same delusions that, that Homer Simpson's friend Barney had when he was drinking, that you're this kind of, you know, elegant and, and sophisticated comedian, and it just makes everybody stupid. When you go to a restaurant, the first thing they do is put bread on the table and ask you if you want alcohol, because both of them drop your frontal lobes. Both of them make it more likely you're gonna order more and spend more money at the restaurant. If I took two people off the street, let's say they do everything in their lives the same, other than what I'm about to say, I gave one of them a casual drink for the next decade, just maybe two drinks a week, three drinks a week for the next decade, and the other person was completely sober for the next decade. When you looked at their brain, in 10 years time, if they were doing everything the same, would you see a difference? Yes. The person who is drinking two or three times a week will have less blood flow. And will that have changed the shape of their brain? Yes, it'll be a little bit more shriveled. They can now see and not have to wait till autopsy studies. The gray matter, the actual neurons, the, um, the structure of the brain shrink. You know, you probably heard, oh, you're killing brain cells. Well, yeah. you actually are. Even for people that were drinking low to moderate amounts of alcohol, so one or two drinks per day, there was evidence of thinning of the neocortex, so loss of neurons in the neocortex, and other brain regions. It is the poison, the acetaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. I think most people don't realize that, that being drunk is actually a poison-induced disruption in the way that your neural circuits work. Alcohol is often used as a sleep aid but alcohol is quite different in that regard. Alcohol is trying to essentially knock out your cortex. Binge drinking definitely kills brain cells. It alters neural communication in such a way that it can change the structure and the function of the brain for a long term. Anytime you binge drink, you're gonna alter the brain, probably permanently. Um, the plasticity can help it recover, but the more you do this, the less likely you are to be able to sort of overcome those um, perturbations. Its toxicity is non-linear, so its toxicity kind of goes like this, meaning at low levels, just a little bit of an increase, but the more you drink, the more it becomes toxic. But there is no dose of ethanol that is helpful. 
In the Western cultures, alcohol is the most harmful drug overall because it's the most harmful drug to society because it's the most widely used drug. Yeah, and alcohol also makes people aggressive. It's the only drug we know that actually makes people aggressive. So you see a massive effect on crime rates because half the people who murder someone are drunk. Oh yeah. And half the people who are murdered are drunk. No family in Britain, if you look at an extended family, three generations, in which, which doesn't have someone who's been damaged by alcohol through addiction, through violence, traffic accidents, or being a victim because of someone else who was drunk and violent. Almost every family in Britain is affected, but we don't own up to it. Right. We kind of push it under the carpet. You know, we, we know there's a problem, but we don't talk about it because, well, we don't know what to do about it. We're embarrassed. People are fearful of other drugs, illegal drugs, because it helps deflect their attention away from the, the problems of alcohol. Politicians love to get hysterical about a new drug because it means they can do something about drugs and don't have to be held to account over their failure to deal with the problems of alcohol. Waking up 100%, 100% of the time, because there are a lot of challenges, again, that you wake up and when they're when, when we're being asked to be this active and this on and this focused and we're gonna be making these big changes we wanna see. I don't wanna wake up feeling groggy, I wanna wake up feeling ready. Today is the tomorrow you were so worried about yesterday. You young people, don't give up, just keep in there, just keep fighting, so be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. I never looked back. A whole new world opened up to me. People report better sleep, better sex, regulated weight, they report clearer skin. People report that their anxiety dissipates. Many people say they find a sense of purpose. They find that suddenly they can take on new challenges. They can start a new career. They can form a charity. They can write the book they always wanted to write. And then like, it is that thing where it's just, you know, your life just changes and people are nice to you finally when like no one's been nice to you. You've li lived in a world like, like the drinking world and the kind of druggy world that I was in. Just like everybody's miserable and they're all mean to each other yeah. constantly. You're just nasty all the time. And then you like go to a meeting and people are like, hey man, like, and you're like just so, it's so confusingly wonderful. I don't miss it generally, like now at all. Like I, like the the sort of chaos I used to invite into my life. Um, I'm like, I'm I'm really much happier now. I, for maybe the first time, am proud of myself that I didn't quit quitting. Unbelievable. Better. Oh, you kidding? I would never be sitting here with you. No way. No chance. Because? Because I wouldn't have been able to have access to myself or other people, or even been able to take in other people uh, if I hadn't changed my life, no way. And I never would have been able to have relationships that I do. I never would have been able to take care of my father the way I did when he was sick, There's so many things. Now, sometimes they talk about you have an epiphany, and I did. It was one day my wife was out, and I was opening up with you, and I thought, am I out of my mind? Yes, and I made a phone call, and I've been sober ever since. That was 32 years ago. It's a very odd feeling. But I had some great people. I spoke to some people at the time. It's one of those things that you don't even, don't even question. Every time the, the chip's not been in control, I've screwed up. And God knows I've screwed up so many times. Oh my gosh, I've screwed up so many times when my chip has not been controlled. This is why I don't like alcohol. And this is why I don't like drugs. Because you're, you're not in control. A substance is doing that, right? But it's a good thing that you have this rage. Because if we can take this, you know, 97 octane fuel and we put it in the right engine control oh my gosh so we need to make sure that high octane is controlled because high octane in the wrong place can blow up a building yeah i think there's an aspect of it that that's clearly has to do with one's own morality because it's too easy to jump on that wagon of it's a disease and my brain's been hijacked and i no longer have a choice in the matter i think there's that element for sure but past a certain point you have to you have to stand up inside yourself and and change you know everybody does with any with any issue ultimately anything else is just a really you know new age excuse if you ask me